There are three universal truths in business today. Three. And I learned this over 18 years as an entrepreneur. Number one, today's employee does not have the work ethic that employees had 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Number two, left to their own devices, your employees will find ways to take advantage of you. Without rules and policies and procedures and everything else, they will find ways to take advantage of you. And most importantly, there are no good people left. You just can't find good people anymore. And I know these are true because I hear it all the time. I'm at events like this all the time. These three themes come up over and over and over again. But there's a problem. There's a problem with that. The problem is that is total bullshit. In fact, that's a cop-out. What it is, it's 1956's model of employee relationships, employee management, employee culture. In 1956, we said, we gave them a job. What the hell else do we have to do? They should be happy to be here. How many people have said that? They should be happy to be here because we pay them. That may have worked in 1956. That doesn't work today. It's an excuse. It's a total excuse. And it's become an excuse for people that don't want to do the work to build great culture. We use a 1956 model to try and build high-performing teams. And we say it don't work because it's an excuse that we don't want to put the work in to build the cultures. All right. When I went to school, the teachers had a little name for me. That name was Disruptive. My young brother's four years younger than me. He came into high school two years after I'd already left. Fortunately for him, he got the same high school English teacher that I got. When she looked at the roll call the first day, she went, Nathan Bean, yes. Are you Adam Bean's brother? He said, yes. She said, I hope you're nothing like him. He was a real troublemaker. <clears throat> Turns out though, when I got out in the real world, what was considered disruptive in school, which was collaborating or cheating, another word that they used to use for it when they didn't like you collaborating, was my greatest asset. All right, so as that little title says just there, I'm a head of people because I've been doing it since I could walk. The thing that I found out through all those 37, 38 years in construction was, wasn't so much about building the things. It wasn't, that wasn't the thing that was my greatest asset. The greatest asset was being able to build teams that could build the stuff even better than I could have built it myself. All right, so as we go through this live training today, there's two ways that I want you to look at this. This is split. Two very distinct ways. Number one is if you're a team member at the, what they call in lean terms, the Gemba, which is, Gemba is a Japanese word for scene of the crime. What it means is in, in lean, it's the work front, okay? So you might be a team member at the Gemba. When we get to the sections, particularly on Scrum and two second lean, these are particularly relevant to you. Not that these two First sections are, those are particularly relevant to you. You don't need to think that you can't take this and start implementing this yourself, regardless of whether you've got the authority to be able to do it or not. It's always easy to ask for permission, that, <laughs> easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. When I started out doing all this stuff, you might say, this is easy for you to say, Benny, your title is, of whatever it is, Forward Planning Integration Manager. Of course, you can go and do all these things. It didn't start out that way. All this stuff that I started doing, I started doing from a little fella. I did on the tools. I did it when I was a leading hand. I did it as a supervisor. I did it when they're in superintendent roles. And it's pushed me into higher and higher roles. A little tip for you there. If you want to move up quicker, learn to do this. <laughs> the other way is from the GM, executive GM, CM type role. More relevant to you is going to be the Vivid Vision and the EXO model. It's not that these two here aren't relevant to you. It's just these are going to be the things that you're going to want to focus on to drive to start with. All right. 
So in construction, the great quote that Dan Sullivan says all the time, he says, comes from Alcoholic Anonymous, and he says, all progress begins with the truth. In construction, what we do to give us that truth is we create a baseline. When you want to build an alliance, you want to build a culture of collaboration, you need first a baseline to see where you're starting from. I'm going to show you a little clip now. Well, when you watch these clips that I show you, a lot of these are from what's uh, something known as Genius Network, and it's a guy called Joe Polish, and he runs, this is the highest, most expensive network on the planet to be involved in. For These are the smartest business minds on the planet, these people. First one up is going to be Perry Belcher. It's going to give you these questions to ask to set your baseline, right? When you watch these videos and you see these talks, people are paying somewhere between $25,000 and $100,000 a year to sit in the room and listen to this stuff. It's, they're not talking about stuff that they think might work. They're not talking about theory from a book, although a lot of them have books. This is stuff that they've used to build multi-million dollar businesses over, some of them billion dollar businesses, over and over and over again. They know what they're talking about. Oh, sorry, I've skipped a step. So, the big picture for this, what we're trying to achieve here, if you go back to the book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Patrick Lanciani says, if you get all the people in an organisation rolling in the same direction, you could dominate any industry and any market against any competition at any time. And it all starts with these couple of questions. So how do you build great teams? Talent's hard enough to find, but to get people to work in teams together, and you guys probably have a lot of great people to work for you or work with you already, um, you've got you to do a couple things, and it really all starts with you. You've got to get your people running toward the proper end of the football field if you're going to win a game, right? People are running against the grain won't make anything happen. And everybody thinks, oh, my people all understand. They're all good. We've got, we've got this... This culture, I hear people talk about culture all the time. I hear people talk about uh, focus and all those things. But you should do this experiment when you get home. If you don't do anything else that I talk about, please do this. Go back when you go home and write these five questions on a piece of paper or form and ask everyone in your company independently. So i just pause this for a second. So you've got time to actually go and get yourself a pen and a paper while I'm talking. Write these down or... Mark where you are in the video here, see how far we are through this live stream. So you can come back to this section and get these five questions down. Without talking to someone else to fill these out and hand them back in to you personally. It will shock the <laughs> out of you what people think you do and how you, they think you do it. Here are the questions. And they're really, these are the Peter Drucker questions. What business are we in? That one will throw you off because you would think everybody's going to get that one right, right? I'd say 30% maybe. Uh, who is our customer? What is our customer value? What have our results been so far? And what's our plan for the future? Right? If you get an agreement above 30%, you're beating the average of everybody I've worked with so far. So how do we expect a team to work as a team in one direction if we don't tell them what direction to move in? Write that down. How do we get a team to move in the same direction if we don't tell them what that direction looks like? Now, the first one is, First one of these four drivers is what's known as a vivid vision. Very good reason that we call it a vision. Martin Luther King, when he stood up in front of all those people, what did he say? He said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a really good idea. Just doesn't have the same impact. Okay, so what is... A vivid vision. How does that work? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a concept called vivid visions. And I know we've all got vision statements. Quick show of hands if you have a vision statement. I really would like all of you to throw it out because we all know how they were made. We all know that you started with a whiteboard. You got a whole bunch of your... 
Just a context, this is another Genius Network clip. This guy is called Cameron Herald, and he was one of the founders that originally built 1-800-GOT-JUNK. People from your company, you put a bunch of words up on the whiteboard, right? You put up all the words that inspired you, and then you kind of eliminated a bunch of the words, and you end up with something that looks like this, and you call that your, your mission statement, and you kind of throw it out there, and it goes live, and this is what's supposed to align and inspire your team, but we know that it doesn't align and inspire anybody. So what I want to do is teach you a concept that is being used by some of the top companies on the planet, but is also being used by some of the top athletes on the planet. I went to a lunch about 15 years ago. It was run by a high-performance sports psychologist, and he sat us all down in the room, and he said he wanted us to look into a crystal ball. And we thought, oh God, this is going to be a complete waste of time. Well, the reason he wanted us to look into a crystal ball is he wanted us to show us what athletes would do, how high-performance athletes would visualize themselves performing the event. And he said, if as CEOs, if we could visualize ourselves running our company three years in the future, and if we could get everyone to see what we could see, we would win. So this concept we've created is called a vivid vision. It's one thing that will completely align your employees, your customers, and suppliers. Think about Let's write that down. It will completely align your employees, your customers, and your suppliers. Now, if you're in construction and you're trying to create a contractor-client relationship, think of the suppliers as that contractor that you're trying to create the relationship with. this for a second. Remember when Brooke Shields was getting married to Andre Agassi? She didn't like her legs. So she put a picture of what she wanted her legs to look like on her wedding day up on the refrigerator. And she wanted to visualize these perfect legs. Well, we all know the marriage between she and Andre didn't work out. He ended up getting married to Steffi Graf. The crazy thing was the photo on the refrigerator was actually Steffi Graf's legs. <laughs> all right, so visualization works. We now know the number one task you have tomorrow is go back. You need to go back to your homes and rip down the photos off your refrigerator that are motivating the wrong person. So that didn't help us. So we looked, we looked for something that did work. Remember contractors? Anybody here ever built a house or done a renovation? Put your hand up. Almost all of you. So when you build a home, you're really the CEO of the project. You have an idea of what the finished project looks like. You can see it. You can feel it. But you have no idea how to do the electrical, how to do the plumbing, how to do the wiring, how to do the drywall. But you know what it needs to look like. And you have no idea how to manage the subtrades. So what you do is you give photos and pictures and sketches and things out of magazines and you hand them to the contractor. Those are your visions of what the home should look like in the future. The contractor then takes those and goes away for a couple of weeks and come back with the blueprints or the plans to make your vision happen. And then they hand the plans to the employees and the employees can literally read your mind. Well, for most of us, when we have a vision statement as one sentence, it doesn't describe your whole company. So the idea with a vivid vision is something much different. Think about the movie, The Sound of Music. Who's seen the movie? Who has never seen the movie The Sound of Music? Who has no idea what the movie's about? No idea? Name? Felix. Felix. So Felix, you're from Europe. You, um, you've never seen the movie The Sound of Music. There's a very famous scene. Don't say anything to Felix, but can I tease you for a little bit? Yes. We know each other. We've talked. So there's a famous scene in the movie where they're having a picnic. And in the picnic scene, I want you to run the same picnic for this group next year. But we're going to have our kids come to the picnic as well. Should the picnic be at a lake in the mountains or at a park? Don't at a lake. Okay, perfect. And where should we get the food for the picnic? It has to be just like the one in The Sound of Music. Should we get the food at Safeway or a grocery store? Or should we buy it at a hut or should we bring it in a picnic basket? Local butcher. Okay, so local grocery store. Perfect. So we're going to get the food at a local grocery store just like they did in The Sound of Music. We're going to have the picnic at a lake just like The Sound of Music. And the kids that are going to be at the picnic, should they be playing baseball, playing croquet, or should they be dancing? Playing soccer, or you have to pick one of the three, unfortunately. Is it baseball, <laughs> croquet? I know you're ADD and out of the box like the rest of us. <laughs> so baseball, croquet. Baseball. baseball, okay, perfect. Thank you, you completely screwed this thing up for me, which is exactly what I needed. Biggest risk for a speaker is to ask the audience, but thank you. They are not having the picnic at a lake. It's in the mountains in the Swiss Alps. The kids were dancing. It was the sound of music, Felix. Like, it was a huge hint for you, okay? <laughs> But, but the problem with us as CEOs is we see the future. We have all this detail and we walk around saying that we're highly intuitive. 
We are no more intuitive than our employees. But if we're the only ones that can see the movie, how can they possibly see what we can see? If you're the only one that can see the movie, how can the people that you're trying to show it to, your employees, your team, see what you're trying to see? So I know we're going to throw the vision statement out the wall, but this vivid vision, what's it actually, what does it actually look like? Well, this week we're going on a lean journey down to Walters and Wolf in Fremont, California, down in the San Francisco Bay Area. About a year ago, Walters and Wolf adopted the two-second lean model, and they're doing a fantastic job. They have a beautiful facility, and what they do is they manufacture the curtain walls or all the glazing you see on the outside of a lot of the big high-rises up and down the West Coast. Very sophisticated operation. We're going to hear from Nick Cosell, the COO, a we, good we friend really of mine. We wanted to kind of visually demonstrate and communicate to our people what our plan was for this year. Okay. So kind of so rather than the old boring strategic plan. So he said just then we want to communicate to our people what the plan was for this year. He's going on to say now instead of our strategic plan, this is what we did instead. This is a vivid vision. This is based off of what Cameron was just talking about. Plan, you know, when the managers go off to their yearly planning meeting. Um, Instead, we kind of wanted to lay it out visually what we were planning on working on this year. And Paul, here, here, uh, here you are. This is kind of where we got started. Hey, that and makes me look a little fatter than I am, Nick. You're hurting. Oh, me, it's man. probably just because you know, you know, like the TV makes you look yeah. fatter. It's probably <laughs> the posters make people look fat. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of the kind of the path of where we've been, and uh, this is kind of entering into our into our uh, next year, and what we're. Uh, hoping to do which is standardize some some of our big processes okay uh, we wanted to really kind of find a sensei to help teach us the tools so that we can learn the tools and and use them ourselves and this kind of road kind of simulates what we think are going to be our obstacles so these are kind of our tell me about the ego why why is that a big deal well I think my way is the best is only way is you know people are very uh, individual and they all believe that the way that they're doing their process is the best so that's going to be a big obstacle is getting people to you know seek that consensus on what really is the best way so that we can have a standard to improve from has there been any secret to making that happen um, I'll let you know actually once we can actually make it happen <laughs> well I think you are making it happen so how come it's happened so effectively in one year for you uh, I think we it's because we're not telling our people the best way to do their process they're deciding on the best way to do their process. So it's definitely... So there's lots of ownership. The, 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 yeah. The person, who knows, the person who's doing the work is the one that knows the best way to do it. That's what mm -hmm. we've been taught, right? So this is those functional silos between departments that we're uh, you know, desperately trying to break down. Really, we don't want different departments. We're all the same department trying to deliver the same product to the customer. I like you have a team sport here too. That's good. So this is a team sport, the company, as opposed to a bunch of different silos. Yeah, so the you know fear of change. Mm -hmm. I mean that that was obviously a fear of failure is another big one. You know people don't, uh, but but this really is. I think that's that's key is is not worrying about trying something new and having it not work. So you get past these things: departmental walls, fear of change, failure of or, or fear of failure, and then you break through. That's a, that's the breakthrough moment. Probably, and then uh, you know at that point we we uh, you know. <laughs> We laugh about this all the time, but uh, you know, it's really quite simple. But it's hard work. Well, it's keeping gotta, it simple and hard work. If it were easy, anybody, you know, anybody mm -hmm. and everybody would be doing it. So it was uh, yeah. a lot and of all the way cool up to 2016. Nuggets. So this will just continue to develop. Yeah, I, th th that we were trying to show that this the, the journey is really never going to end. It's right. just going to keep on going. It's simple, but it's hard work. As he says, he says a little more eloquently than I do. What I say is, if it was easy, every f would be doing it. All right, so we know our vivid vision is going to show everyone very clearly the path that we're on, how this alliance is going to work, how we expect this. It takes the, the CEO, the GM, the EGM's vision, transforms that into something, a map, that everyone can look at and can follow. It aligns our employees, our customers, and our suppliers. Now we know to start getting hold of some tools. 
that we can use too. We don't just want to create decent results. We want exceptional results. We want what's known as 10x or exponential results. That's where we want to aim for. The model that we're going to use to do that, funnily enough, called the EXI model. What's that? Imagine you could double your revenues, triple your profits, and prepare your organization for an exponential future. Hi, I'm Salim Ismail, author of Exponential Organizations. When we wrote the book 10 years ago, we unveiled a blueprint for accelerating 21st century organizations to thrive amidst technological disruption and rapid change. In the past decade, hundreds of thousands of organizations have embraced the 11 EXO attributes, achieving incredible results. We've seen novel initiatives, innovative lines of business, processes re-engineered and billions of dollars of value created. A deep analysis showed that in the Fortune 100, the top 10 that used the EXO attributes the most delivered 40 times the shareholder returns than the bottom 10 that used them the least. Why? Because as the external world becomes more volatile, your ability to adapt will drive market value and we now have that blueprint. Our flagship EXO transformation sprint has been implemented in over 100 large organizations worldwide, from Procter & Gamble to Black & Decker to HP to cities of like Miami and public sector environments. We've trained and certified over 1,000 coaches and consultants to apply this model. The EXO model turns out to work across industries, across cultures, across languages. From the smallest startups to the largest enterprises in public sector or private sector or impact projects, the EXO model is delivering unbelievable results across the world. The message is now very clear. As technological and business change accelerates, the EXO model is the secret sauce for any organization to thrive in the future. We offer various paths for your exponential and EXO transformation tailored to your unique situation. Whether you want to explore our many free resources or engage us in a premium exploration with certified coaches, there's a path for you to deliver exponential transformation and 10x growth to your organization. Join us and open up your EXO future. Welcome to Open EXO. All right, so there are, I was gonna say, hopefully that comes up, 11 attributes that they've identified these high growth startups use. I tend to use in this six of them. So the first one right up the top there, of course, is the MTP, the Massive Transformative Purses, Purpose. What we're gonna to speak to today, the other attributes are, make sure we've got the pen here, not working, of course. Technology never works when you want it to. That should work there now. Oh, actually, I should tap, tap on that and bring that right. So, now we've got the eraser. We don't want the eraser, we want the pen. Dashboards. You don't walk into any football stadium, any sort of sports stadium in the world. You've got the Olympics on at the moment. <clears throat> when you walk into a stadium, what's the most important thing, the biggest thing that you see? It's the scoreboard. In business, your scoreboard is your dashboard. So experimentation is another one that we use. That happens with two second lane. Autonomy, two second lane also drives that. Social, I'm using social right at the moment, these live streams. It's not giving us a nice pretty circle, but that'll do anyway. So let's undo it and try and do a nice pretty circle. I'm using social right at the moment. LinkedIn Life to drive culture. We're going to look at that in a minute and how we use that with something Japanese call Yokoten. All right, uh, community and crowd. We want to use that one. We'll show you how we use that in a minute. And the other one is engagement. We're going to show you how to pull all of those in using the EXO method. All right, so I mentioned Yokoten. This is the description I downloaded off the internet of Yokoten today. A Japanese word that roughly translates to best practice sharing across an organization. This sharing can be successes, learnings, concepts, ideas, policies, and experiences that may be useful for others. So the way that I'm using Yoko 10 right now to do that, and I've done this for quite a while on the project that I'm on, is every week I use a LinkedIn Live and speak to people. This is the stuff that I want to put in place on site next week, run through on the board, 
And by the time I got back to site on Monday morning, the ones that were on site already watched it. And the ones that had come flying back in from R&R &R tend to have watched it and they're on the same page as me already. So they've got, no, they can see in their heads what I'm speaking to and how I'm going about it. That's one, how I use one of the attributes. By the way, he says there's 11 attributes that there are. In the book, or one of the trainers, he says, if you get just four of them right, four of those 11 attributes, you'll drive, well and truly drive towards those 10 extra results and run rings around everyone else in your competition. So dashboards, we need that scoreboard. We use the social, podcasts, LinkedIn lives, all our social media profiles to show people the journey that we're going on, that vivid vision. This is how we're doing it. This is what we did. This is what we did this week to move us in the path of creating that alliance. This one down here is, you might think is an unusual one. And one of the best ways, I haven't actually done this yet. I'm in the process of setting it up at the moment. Something that started in Mexico, and this is one a fantastic way to not only take our lessons learned, keep those two words in your mind, all of our lessons learned, and actually build our community around that. This is the story of five friends. It was a Friday night in 2012 in Mexico City. After several mezcales, the friends decided they'd heard enough about success and each decided to share a story about their failed projects. The conversation was so inspiring that they decided to do it again, but this time with even more friends. Two weeks later, they did it again. The five friends all invited their friends, and they asked three people to share their biggest failures. That was the first of them. Sharing stories of failure was liberating. It was fun and authentic. So the friends decided to keep it going and organize nights once a month. Turned out that people all over the world wanted to bring nights to their city. So the five friends decided to take their project seriously and set a goal to bring up nights to the world. In April 2015, up nights is celebrating reaching 100 cities all over the world with a presence on every continent, except Antarctica. Today, Up Nights is the most active creators movement on the planet. Each month, more than 10,000 people worldwide make time to go to Up Nights and listen to three people publicly share their failures. The movement is dedicated to three kinds of people. Those who have failed, those who will fail, and the liars. Free your failures. The world will thank you. Three kinds of people, those who have failed, those who will fail, and the lies. Right. So we know the EXA model, three attributes so far. There's another three that two second lane is going to drive for us, but the three attributes that we're going to look at that are essential for this. Dashboards, our scoreboards, our social, to drive our yoga 10, and community and crowd, to build that community around what we're actually doing, making this something a bit bigger than just the work that we do. Time to start getting into the tools. How do we, the nuts and bolts, how do we make this happen day to day? <clears throat> to do that, kick into one of my favorites, which is actually Scrum. Now I graduated from West Point and I went into the Air Force. Uh, while I was at West Point, I learned something from other leaders. I lived in a room which, where, that had a plaque on the mantelpiece that said, General Dwight D. Eisenhower slept here. And every time I'd read that plaque, I'd remember his famous quote, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Write that down. This is all about our planning scrummies. A lot of it, some of it's execution, it's all about our planning. Plans are useless, but planning is essential. I forgot to introduce Scrum properly. It's, it's, there's a line out of the book that says, it's easy to make the business case for Scrum. If you use it, you'll make more profit. 
get, do twice the work in half the time. Very simple, it just works. So when I got to be a fighter pilot, I was in reconnaissance. We did a lot of planning. But one day, one of my fellow pilots at Atterbury was blown out of the air over Hanoi by a SAM missile. And I said to myself, he did really good planning, but he was flying straight and level over the target. That could get me killed. What is, this is one of the most powerful meetings that there is in Scrum. It's called a retrospective. He's doing exactly what uh, Jeff Sutherland's talking about here just now. Looking at how you executed and then going, what did we do that could have been done better? This is taking our lesson learns, our f ups, all the rest of it, and going, how do we improve this process? It's a, don't disregard this part of it. It's so vitally important to the whole lot. From that day forward, my plan was to have a vision where the target was, and as soon as I crossed North Vietnam, I went into an evasive maneuver. There's a V word again, vision. Maneuver, because every second I knew I was being fired at. And only at the last moment would I come up straight and level off for a target, just for a second, to snap that photo. Now I got out of there alive, over half the people I flew with did not come back from their missions. And when I came back to the United States, it was a big surprise. I had come so close to getting killed so many times, it felt like it was a new life. Every day was like a bonus day, a free day. And while I was there, a big banking company running 150 banks all over North America came by and they said, you know, at the university, you have the best expertise in technologies we use at the bank. You have all the knowledge and know the, none of the money. But at the bank, we've got all the money, and we don't know what we're doing. You should come work for the bank, and it would be a perfect marriage of knowledge and money. And they made me an offer that my wife couldn't refuse, a poor university professor. So I wind up at the bank, and what do I see? I see they're running all these huge projects, hundreds of developers, and they manage all these projects with a Gantt chart. And this is a technology that was introduced to the military of the United States in 1910. <laughs> it didn't work very well in World War I, and it didn't work very well then, because every piece of the project is lined up with a date, and if anybody misses that timing, the whole project is delayed. And when it gets delayed, the customers get upset, the managers get angry. They would force these developers to work nights, weekends, they go on death marches. It reminded me of the Roman galleons, you know, the slaves rowing, rowing. The whip is cracking. But as a fighter pilot, I knew the essence of the problem. These guys could not land a project. You know, we learned as a fighter pilot that we had to very carefully bang that airplane right on the end of the runway. And if we did it, we might go halfway down the runway and slide off the runway into the trees. And that's what they were doing every project, sliding off the runway into the trees. So I went to the CEO and I said, this bank is totally screwed up. If you give me the worst business unit in the bank, I will fix it just like I fixed company L2. As a coach, bear Bryant quote. Then speak to what Jeff just spoke about then. See, he didn't go and ask for the best team. Coach Bear Bryant used to say, on any given day, I'll take my team and I'll beat your team. Or, I'll take your team and I'll beat my team. It's all about knowing how to get the best out of your team. And he said, Sutherland, if you want that headache, you've got it. So I said, okay, 
I will report to you once a month, to you and the senior management, and the rest of the time, you stay out of my unit. This is what is known in Scrum as working in sprints. We'll get a block of work that we're gonna do in the next seven days, and we sprint. Get that done. Retrospective, plan, do a retrospective on what we've just done, plan the next sprint off sprint. It's continuous loop. Extremely powerful concept. We're gonna run this as a little company in a company, like a startup. And so we broke them down into small teams, sales, marketing, installs, engineering, everyone, all working together with team incentives in a collaborative space. And we ran weekly cycles. We began building a backlog of what we, what we needed to do. And I began to show them how to land the airplane. How is it that a pilot can make a perfect touchdown? He has to look at altitude, airspeed, rate of descent, the heading of the airplane, understand the wind and the weather, and every few seconds being adjusting constantly. So every week they would try to land the airplane at the end of the runway, bang. And week after week they did it, and surprise, surprise, in less than six months, that team was the best team in the bank. They had gone from the worst money losing unit to the most profitable unit in the bank because they made their work visible. The team was given the responsibility to fix the problem and they self-organized to make it happen. It's all about learning how to land the airplane. They made the work visible. There's that vision word again. All right, so you're probably thinking now, right, Abani? We get it. Get the vivid vision, get the employees, the customers, and the suppliers lined. Yep, XA model. We need scoreboards, Yoga 10. We need to transfer this information to everyone laterally across the business so everyone's on the same page. We all know where we're going, all know where we're heading. We can get the community and crowd bit. We understand Scrum, we need to do these planning sessions. We need to have structure to how we plan, how we execute, and we need to be looking at our progress more closely, bringing that time loop back together to a week. How are you going to drive the last three, I'm sure I can spell there, what do we call them? Attributes from the EAXO model, which are autonomy, engagement, and most importantly, how the hell are you gonna drive experimentation? Particularly when a lot of the time we're in high risk environments. The world is dysfunctional. Organizations, are highly dysfunctional. And those people that do lean correctly, no one can touch them. The differential is not, you know, 50%, 100%, it's 600%. They dwarf everyone. Paul, we've chatted a, a few times here about two second lean. Mm -hmm. What What is this and how is it different to normal lean? And there's lean this and lean that and I'm all kind of confused and all over the place. What is two second it's a, it's lean? A beautiful question and I think I can explain it pretty simply. In essence, I couldn't figure out how to get some of my people to make improvements. They just were, you know, flummoxed. How, what, what do I do? And I walked into my injection molding department. There was this young man named uh, Nick. He was 18 years old. And I said, what was your improvement today? Because every day I walked in my entire facility for, for two years and made sure everybody was doing their improvements and supported them and helped them in make improvements. And he said he, he couldn't, make, couldn't think of one. And I asked him, you know, everything's perfect. You mean nothing's bothering you? And he said, well, yeah, there is something that bothers me. I put the injection mold in and I have to put my head in there and, and it's really uncomfortable and, you know, the level and I can't see everything. And so we ended up gluing a piece of, a plastic mirror onto a level so glued that 
to make the process better. Experimentation. You could set the level on it, look at it without even moving inside the machine. It made it very comfortable for him. And he goes, wow, that was cool. And we did it, you know, in five minutes. And I said, Nick, that's all I want you to do is make one two second improvement a day. Just. That's all I want you to do. Make one two second improvement per day. Autonomy. Engagement. Make it so that you just don't have to do the two seconds in and out. The simplest, stupidest thing. So two second lean is simply understanding that small improvements matter. Write that down. This is the most powerful concept probably in this whole book. When I spoke to early on in the piece, I said, look at this through two sets of eyes. Whether you're the CEO, EGM, GM, whether you're just one team members, not just, whether you're a team member at the Gemba doing actual work. The smallest improvements that you make, all, they don't add up, they compound. It's an extremely powerful concept. If you do this enough, day after day after day after day, if you do just get a 1% improvement every day, every day for 72 days in a row, you've doubled your results, what you're actually able to output. That's the way that it compounds. You don't need any authority to do this. Don't ask for permission. Take the initiative, use your autonomy, and go and do it. And then the last thing I'm going to add to that comment is this. Dr. Ken Mogi is a good friend of mine. Ryan, you've met Ken, haven't you? Ken, yeah. 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 He's one of the top neuroscientists in the world. Teaches at the University of Tokyo. He's on the Japan study mission with us. He comes with us often. And this guy's a brilliant guy. And he taught me something. And Ryan, I believe, heard him speak the last time, Ryan. You were with him? Yeah. Everything yeah. starts with small things. That's it. And the Japanese understand this. And if you're willing to be good at the small things, then everything else will grow and take care of itself from there. And that's what Two Second Lean is. It's taking care of the small things daily. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about the tyrant. I would say that's my trapping at the minute, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I met Ryan a couple of months ago. I went to his incredible factory tour up in St. Matters in Limavady, Northern Ireland. And as this is amazing, and I came back with all this energy, yeah, 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 yeah. and there is this shadow side of me that wants to control yes, and wants yes, to yes, in, yes, in, yes. influence and manipulate. Oh. All my tentacles are going all over my team. You know, my producer Mark's like nodding his head. He's like, "Get off me! Get these tentacles away from yeah, me!" Yeah, 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 and you've yeah. just hit on something really important there, which is, I'm going to call it a, a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down. Completely, down. completely. And it's letting your people fail. I mean, Ryan knows this as well as me, but I'm. It's letting your people fail. Experimentation. Small fires that aren't going to be critical to the business's success. I mean, I can't, 50% of everything we do at Basscap fails, all the ideas. And I, I, I've made well over 100 improvements from last, from Saturday to Monday in the Japan experience. I've made over 100 improvements between last week and this week. And just a score, a score of three days. And many of those things didn't work. They didn't quite work out the way I wanted. I had to readjust them. It's just a giant experiment. All right, if you liked this training so far, then you love this. You don't want to around for 37 years like I did working all those how, how to build high performance teams it's simple but it's extremely hard work and are things that you can do to dramatically increase the process i'm pretty good at i know how to do this shit i've been building it been doing it since i've could walk literally building stuff if you want some help you got a project you're the agm the gm ceo you've got your team here, contracting team there, PC team in between, whatever it may be, 
and there isn't any sort of alliance, although everyone sits in meetings and spurts out the words collaboration and alliance verbatim. But you know, what's really happening is you got a bunch of people running around what like a fire drill and they're not necessarily doing the most productive thing that they should be doing. You want to drive in better results. Message me the words what we're we going to use for this one. Let's call it Alliance Drivers. Message me the words Alliance Drivers. Organise a time to catch up for a chat. Just a quick 15 minute chat to see if we think we might be a good fit to work together or not.